Hi, I'm Patricia Grabarek. And I'm Katina Sawyer, and welcome to the Worker Being Podcast. Today, we're really excited to be joined by Megan Nolan, the founder of Vitality Wellness. Um, she's going to be talking to us a little bit about her background in yoga and, and the workplace, and we're really, really excited to learn from you, Megan. So welcome. It's nice to have you. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Would you like to start off with introducing yourself a little bit, giving us some color to your background and how you got to where you are today? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Well, I guess I should start by saying aloha because I'm actually out on the island of Maui. And so my work is based out of Maui currently, although I do a lot online. But my journey has taken me out here. I've been out here for about seven years. But this incarnation of my business is about, you know, three years old. And I got into this work by way of my educational background was actually in gerontology. So my degree is in gerontology, which was amazing and wonderful and super educational for me, but quickly realized that I, well, I'm such an empathetic, you know, sensitive person that it really wasn't ideal for me to be in the sort of nursing home care facility sort of environment. And so I decided to approach gerontology from the more preventative side having always loved to exercise and dance and run. And so I decided after I graduated that I would become a personal trainer. And so I became a personal trainer. And then within about three years of doing that certification, I decided based on the fact that I was really loving yoga at the time, I thought, okay, well, maybe I should, you know, add to my collection of certifications and do a yoga teacher training certification. And so really saw a beautiful opportunity for overlap because there's so many principles that we use in yoga that when applied to exercise and when applied to life really help us boost our vitality and our longevity in the current moment, but over the lifespan. And so I was able to sort of intermingle those things and bring it back into my, my background in gerontology to help people make choices now that would promote their health over the lifespan and, and also allow them to, you know, live, move and feel their best now and long term. So that's kind of how I got to where I am right now as far as vitality wellness. And so it's just been really fun to bring those worlds together. That's awesome. Um, and I love how you've sort of been able to parlay that background um, in gerontology um, into a, sort of a business that has a focus on wellness and thinking about um, how people can really live lives that are healthy and happy. And, you know, we focus on uh, that from a workplace perspective. So uh, that's right up our alley. Mm -hmm. um, we're interested to learn kind of about some of the challenges that uh, you faced in sort of starting your business and making your work and life fit together. I know that your business is focused on wellness, but sometimes even when you're running a wellness focused business, it can be difficult to keep your own wellness top of mind. So um, were there particular challenges that you faced in kind of making your work and life fit together as you were putting this company together and anything that you found really worked for you in balancing those things? Definitely. I, I know that, you know, as it is for many different disciplines, you know, for example, the chef always comes to mind where the chef is always preparing food for people all the time. And then oftentimes chefs will just kind of eat a pack of ramen noodles or something for dinner. You know, it's like they, they have a hard time like making time for themselves in that sense. And, and it was the same for me because initially I was spending so much time in the gym when I was doing only personal training that I couldn't get out of there fast enough. <laughs> and then I realized, you know, where is my authenticity if I'm not exercising? And it's exercise has been such a key component to my overall health, whether that's on a physical or mental level for my lifespan, that I realized, you know, this is something that's absolutely non-negotiable. And recognizing it as a challenge to actually fit it into my day and fit it into my schedule. And I, I really saw earlier, early on that, I need to make time for myself first thing in the morning. And it's so important because for me, it really sets the tone for my whole day. And because I'm in such a giving role where I'm, you know, giving people attention, giving people energy, I'm, you know, I'm spending a lot of time intimately with people. It's really important that I give myself time. And so the way that I sort of handled that challenge was to make it a non-negotiable for me to have time with myself every morning. And so I've instituted a little 
guideline that I'm not allowed to be on my phone until after breakfast. And so first thing in the morning is always my my warm lemon water and my meditation and then my yoga and my exercise and then my smoothie. And then I can be on the phone because otherwise, you know how it is. Like we can just wake up and go right into life as entrepreneurs and mm-hmm. like anybody. We're like, oh, what's happening on Facebook right now? You know, it's like we haven't even got out of bed and we're already giving the world our attention. And in my practice and in my work, I teach people how to draw their intention intention and attention inwards and to really tune in and get aligned with themselves, whether that's physically, mentally, and emotionally, so that we can really give ourselves that opportunity to pay attention to the inner workings and the subtleties of ourselves and not just all the craziness that goes on around us, you know, so we need, we deserve our own attention. And that's what I, I recognize for myself, but that's also one of the things that I really help to institute in my teaching and my work. I'm so impressed by you. That sounds amazing. I've always wanted to do one of those morning routines, but I'm like not a morning person. So mm-hmm. I'm never awake early enough to to get myself to do that. And I, I would love to be that person. Um, I'm assuming every day isn't easy. So how do you get through those tough days or maybe you don't want to wake up and ignore your phone? You're right. They're definitely not all the same, you know, and there's definitely (laughs) some snoozing and, but I just, I mean, I'm sort of one of those. I mean, we all do, but I definitely learn by experience and I've had moments when I've snoozed and snoozed and tried to go on Facebook and then I only have, you know, 10 minutes for myself and it really changes everything about my day. You know, my body's not awake yet and then I have to go to work. And so I just realized, you know, as hard as it is to get out of bed in those times, I know the importance of it and I know the impact. And so I try to just remind myself that like, you need this, go, (laughs) you know? And so (laughs) I really learned. And so I try to institute that all the time. But when it's harder, I just, you know, I, I give myself a break sometimes. I mean, it doesn't happen every day and that's okay. And if it's only 10 minutes, that's okay. It's 10 minutes, you know, it's really acknowledging the effort. And that's important is really seeing what we can do, what we can make time for, and then building on that. Yeah. I mean, I think that also, so I'm not like the biggest morning person either, but I think also, you know, whatever time, I'm sure it doesn't have to be in the morning. It could be in the evening if that's your time to unwind or whatever the case may be. But I think part of why you don't want to get up and start doing your daytime stuff is because the stuff that you have to do is kind of like, it might not be your favorite thing, right? But mm-hmm. if you can create like a real, like something you look forward to a time that you really like spending and you get that into that habit, it might also get easier over time to be like, oh, I'm not going to, the idea of getting up doesn't mean like I'm getting up to start rushing into X, Y, Z. I'm getting up and easing into a day, which might be more appealing to wake up for than like waking up and just being slammed with a bunch of to do's. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really what it's about is sort of easing into the day, taking time for yourself, setting tone, setting the tone for the day rather than just like, okay, up and eating and running out the door, you know, then that creates the sort of hectic busyness throughout the whole day, at least for me. And so even just giving yourself time at any time of the day, whatever works for you. I know some people that have children, it's hard for them to do it in the morning. And so when they go to sleep at night, that's the perfect time, but it's really just giving yourself some time and it can be, you know, anything from 10 minutes or five, two minutes, who cares? Just giving yourself that time. And once we get into the habit, then we start to feel the benefit and then we're more likely to repeat it. Well, I'm going to take you as an inspiration and try to make some of those shifts in my own life. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Good. So in terms of yoga, so going back Mm -hmm. to kind of where your focus is today, what really drew you to yoga? So you mentioned that as you were starting, um, you know, you're doing the personal training and then you started getting into yoga. And so you kind of went after that certification, what drew you to yoga and what have you learned, um, through the practice that is really shows that can, you can communicate to everybody as to why it's so important for your physical and mental health. Initially, what drew me to the practice was I was, I wasn't personal training yet. Um, I was still in university at the time and, and I was going to a gym where they had a a yoga type class. It was kind of a yoga hybrid with some other different movement based modalities like Tai Chi and a little bit of Pilates. And so it was just sort of a amalgamation of mind body practices. And so that's where I started. And then a friend of mine set came to the class and she was like, that's not really yoga. And I was like, okay, take me to a yoga class. (laughs) And so I was like, you know, I got to it and, and it was really 
definitely as it is with anything was an evolution. And as you have different teachers and different styles, it, it started to become something that was initially something I did as a physical practice. I mean, to balance the strength training and the more intensity running that I was doing to come into that flexibility and the softness, more of the sort of yang, like the relaxation, the yin energy needed to get balanced, you know? And so that was sort of, it at the beginning, but then as I started to deepen my study and my understanding of it, realizing that it was something that was so much more than just the physical poses, it was actually a whole framework for for understanding myself and understanding you know life and teaching me all of these different tools by way of the poses, you know, by way of learning to hold yourself in alignment and being able to stay focused and stay aware and become aware of distractions, but come back to task by way of focusing on the breath. And it became such a curiosity for me because I had a teacher point out really early on, and it's interesting because it's kind of mirrored in my work, but she said, you know, you barely breathe in at all, but you take the longest exhales. And she said, you know, what that tells me is that you're not taking in enough for yourself. You're not really deepening and you're not receiving as much as you can because you're you're constantly giving out, both through your breath and both through your work. And I was just like, whoa, <laughs> okay, this is a really amazing teaching moment. And I started to realize and then start to feel the impact of, of bringing my breath more into balance um, by way of lengthening the inhale and being very intentional with that and, and really mirroring that in my my time for self-care and nourishing my relationship with myself and then balancing that with a really smooth controlled exhale and so then started to learn and understand more of the physiology and the impact of breathing because it's such a powerful tool for us to come out of the busyness of the mind and very quickly activate our parasympathetic nervous system. So to shift us out of stress or fight or flight and bring us into a calm state. And most of us, when we're busy, i.e. at work or engaging with life around us, we tend to take short, shallow breaths, which is a stressed breathing pattern. So we're subconsciously not really knowing we're triggering a low level of stress by way of the breath. And if we can consciously shift the breath, drop it down low and slow it down, then we can already begin to slow down our rhythms and slow down our nervous system so that we are moving out of that stress state on a regular basis. And so just realizing like yoga is prioritizing the breath and using it in all these different ways, but it's such a practical tool for lowering our stress levels that it's something that became something that I really wanted to share with people. And I wanted them to understand how available it was to them and how vital it was for them. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's really interesting because not only does yoga as a practice draw attention for you yourself inwardly to focus on, you know, more of what is garnering your attention, what's difficult for you, why is it difficult for you, but it also allows other people who have been trained in the practice of yoga to look at and pay attention to what you're doing from that perspective as well. And when you were Mm. sharing that story, Um, about what your teacher said, it was really interesting because it brought back a memory that I had from a yoga instructor. Um, I had been doing Ashtanga yoga Mm -hmm. for a couple of years with the same instructor and she was amazing. But um, about six months or so into the practice, um, at the end of every class, I was like, you know, you hang out with the people in your class and you talk to people or whatever. And um, I was talking with folks in class and um, I was saying, you know, oh, like you're really good at this or you're really good at that pose or headstand or whatever. And she came up to me afterwards and she was like, you know, it's really nice of you that you always tell people what they're good at and you're encouraging towards people in terms of like what poses they're good at, but you should probably stop and pay attention to why you're thinking about who's the best at each pose. Mm. Like, why is that important to you <laughs> mm-hmm. to, to look around the room and try to figure out who's the best one? Right. Because you're yeah. clearly paying attention to it. And it's nice yeah. that you're telling people that you're the best, but why are you spending mental energy trying to figure that out? Mm. And I was like, that is super interesting. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is your whole and, life, Katina. <laughs> yeah, it like really made me think. I was like, wow, I am paying a lot of attention to who's the best. Like, that's not the point. Of, that's not the point of this class at all is who's the best at headstand, but I am paying attention to that. Why am I paying attention? Right. So 
I just thought that was such an interesting insight. And it made me think of that when you were telling that story. So I think that's also cool and interesting about yoga is that you also have instructors and other people around you that can help you pay attention to things that you might not even be conscious of yourself as you're engaging in those activities. Totally. And that's really ultimately what yoga is, is a practice of awareness. And it's whether we can become aware by what somebody reflects back to us, or we become aware by our own observation, it's the opportunity for us to pay attention. And that really helps us to train our attention and train our focus. And so, you know, in your case, your attention was sort of in and about the class and your teacher was saying, perhaps we could shift that into you. And what, you know, so mm-hmm. It's the opportunity <laughs> for us to see it, you know, and, and truly see it without any judgment and with only completely just love. It's the opportunity for us to really see ourselves and how we can learn and how we can grow. Mm-hmm. Totally. And going back to the focus piece we're talking about. So, you know, it's obviously about a focus inward and yourself and and trying to um, slow your breathing, manage the breathing. When we're looking at the workplace, you know, you mentioned that as a stressor and people tend to breathe maybe in the not the best ways when they're in a stressful environment or when they're busy, they're not focusing on that. They're not um, using the breath properly. Why should employees and employers care about people um, managing that that breath or and using the practices of yoga in the workplace? Well, literally, like first and foremost, if you look at it from the stress management perspective, stress is involved with every chronic disease. It's a factor in every chronic disease. And so if we can do whatever we can to lower our stress levels, we will have an immediate effect on our health. And from the workplace perspective, there is not to mention just the stress element, When we are sitting in what I like to call the computer posture, which we all probably know what it looks like, you know, it's that sort of (laughs) rounded over, like I look like a T-Rex or, you know, my head is poking forward, what have you, is that going out of that neutral, more upright alignment into that rounded over position where we're rounded over the phone or the keyboard, it's literally 30% more difficult. So 30% more difficult for us to take a deep, full breath. So our vital lung capacity drops by 30% when we're in that rounded posture. And so people are, A, having trouble taking a deep breath, but when we're in that, excuse me, when we're in that position, actually the energy and the oxygen to our brain slows down. So 90% of the nourishment and the nutrition to the brain actually comes from movement of the spine. So if people are sort of stuck in that rounded, weaker position, then not only are they triggering the stress response, but they're slowing down the activity of the brain. And so their energy levels are dropping, their attention, their focus is dropping, their productivity is dropping, and and then their pain levels are more than likely increasing because they're they're not in a great alignment. And so they could, you know, be causing tension and pain and potentially down the road, injury and illness. And so integrating these principles of breath awareness, postural awareness, taking regular movement breaks is amazing for the individual. It has basically all the opposite effects to what I just said. It allows them to be more alert and in a stronger posture, more energized, more focused, their creativity goes up. So that helps the individual, but then that has implications for the workplace, the employer, because then this person is on their game. You know, they're really on task. They have great relationships with their, their team members because they're not feeling like dragging and, and irritable or what have you. And they're less likely to get sick. And if they get sick, they recover more quickly. They're less likely to get injured. And if they get injured, they recover more quickly. And so it's sort of, it has benefits for the individual and for the organization to start to integrate these tools. Mm-hmm. I think it's really interesting what you mentioned about the breath, the 30% harder to breathe deeply in that position. I'd never thought of that. And I hadn't read anything about that before. And it makes a lot of sense. And that's, I'm glad you pointed that out because that is a really, I mean, I'm just surprised by that number. That's, that's very interesting. Have you run into a lot of employers that, I mean, obviously you work with um, groups at work very often. So how, how have employers reached out to you? Why do they usually reach out to you? They've reached out to me because, well, either I've gone in and chatted with them and started to share the tools and started to, you know, help them understand. We've also had um, the Blue Zones Project. Have you heard of that? The Blue Zones Project? Mm -mm. 
No, so it's pretty cool. You would love it. You should look into it. So um, Dan Butner, he's a National Geographic researcher. He identified what he calls blue zones. So it's places around the planet where there's higher rates of centennialism. So when people live to 100. And so they started to recognize that in these pockets, so that, for example, in Greece and in Japan, and there's several in California, and there's another one in Oregon, where people are concentratedly living a very long lifespan. And so we started to recognize that in these areas, there's certain consistencies. So there's people, they have a more plant-based diet. They have um, a high social interaction, so a strong community presence. They have a connection to a source, a God, a universe, you know, so they have some sort of prayer and then they, they're really focusing on moving naturally. So they're not necessarily exercising, but there's a lot more walking. So think of like the Mediterranean culture where people are walking all the time or they're out and they're gardening. And so the Blue Zones project actually started to get implemented in, in many different areas in the U.S. And so Maui just became a Blue Zones. And so what they did was it's sponsored by HMSA. And so they come in and then they start to integrate these different practices. So these different principles that he had identified into our community and so helping people make healthier choices. And so um, they were approaching many different workplaces and they want people to make these healthy choices easier. And so two of the principles, so one of them I mentioned was to move more. And another one is to downshift, which they explain as lowering your stress levels. And so when people started to have this conversation, I sort of went, hi, my name's Megan. This is what I do. <laughs> and so I kind of, you know, approached them and said that, you know, this is amazing because it was all aligning with the values of my business and of myself to help people learn these tools to move more naturally and, and lower their stress levels naturally through the breath or relaxation or whatever it is. So that really initiated a lot of the conversation locally, which is great. And it's so exciting to have our community shifting in that direction. So that's really amazing. Do you ever find when you're talking with organizations that are interested in this kind of thing that they work with you not only to implement some of these practices, but it also inspires them to think about how much stress they're putting on their employees in general? Um, is there a way to sort of intervene as someone who knows a lot about stress and the impacts of stress, not just from thinking about how do we cope with the stress that we've experienced, but also thinking about how do you advocate to organizations that maybe they're creating work environments that are too stressful overall? Um, are there tips that you have for employers to create an actually less stressful environment? I mean, there's never going to be a workplace that's stress-free or a job that's stress-free. So obviously these practices are all helpful and in life, they're just helpful in general. Um, but is there a way or are things that you can do at an organizational level to help companies to understand how to implement some of these stress reduction tactics in a way that actually impacts the structure of people's jobs? That's a great question. And, and that's definitely, it's a delicate one because, you know, if they identify it themselves, then that's an easier conversation to have. And I can sort of broach it in a very delicate way, but, you know, I just want to sort of introduce the concept without saying you're really stressing your people out, <laughs> you know? <Right. laughs> so, you know, the way that I nurture the conversation is presenting the tools and then it's one thing to have tools, but it's a really important thing to put them to use. And so when it comes to this sort of thing with the stress conversation, it also also requires a bit of a shift in the culture of the organization. And so having somebody that's sort of spearheading the morning and the afternoon breaks or creating an internal challenge and so that it's something that they start to integrate and realizing that the you know the the effects can broaden that way. But um Right now, it's that's sort of been the level of conversation that I've had with them because it's just something that's been a bit delicate so far. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I was just thinking about, um, you know, if there are some takeaways like in an ideal world or what you wish managers would be doing or mm. some things that managers might do uh, to implement some new tools or tactics of the ways that they actually like lead their teams um, so that people would, you know, have uh, these practices kind of embedded into their work day in some way. Um, but if there are like some managers or leaders listening, what do you wish that they knew about stress reduction or what kinds of tools do you usually recommend uh, managers use with their team to, to make this part of their practice as opposed to, um, you know, something that they put here and there? 
I definitely, once they understand the benefit, then, then they are more willing to advocate for the shorter movement breaks throughout the day. Because a lot of times people think, oh, they're just taking a break again. What are they doing? They're standing up and they're waving their arms around. Why? Sit back down and do your work. But if they understand the impact and the importance of what they're doing, then encouraging people, like setting aside time that they're not penalized for, that's still like, you know, within their work time that they're getting paid, whether it's, you know, a, a one minute break here and there. But setting aside time and actually encouraging people to do that and to get into the habit of it, that's a great way to start. Because otherwise, if it's something that, you know, people are given the tools for, but they're not really given permission, then that can create a little bit of a disconnect. Yeah. And also, what about for the employees? So it sounds like there's some things that the managers can do. But what if I was an individual level contributor, if I'm... um you know, just kind of entry level or Mm -hmm. not managing people and my manager's not supportive, what would you recommend for me um, to be able to implement some of these movement breaks? How would you do that if um, someone was listening and asking you? Well, I think there's a, a several different ways where we can, we can do that. One of them is so simple and it's, totally free is I have my clients um, just with a post-it note or whatever, make a note for themselves that they can place in their, in their workstation that they will see and saying, sit tall and take a deep breath. And so there's a visual reminder for them to sit tall and take a deep breath because, you know, it's easy for us to forget that. And so if there's a visual reminder, they're more likely to actually, oh, okay, there I am. And, and, doing it periodically because then there's a cumulative effect when people are integrating that into their day. Another great way or thing to do is for to have somebody to have a think about periods during the day when they notice that their energy level drops. So oftentimes people have one mid morning and or mid afternoon. And so if we could do integrate a little movement break, so whether it's, you know, one to 10 minutes before that happens, then people can keep their energy level on a more even keel. And then they're less likely to kind of slump into that weaker posture. They're less likely to go for another coffee or any sort of, you know, sugary snack, what have you. Then they're boosting their energy naturally. So that's another great way to do it is to put the brakes slightly before they start to get lethargic. And then another one that's really easy, you know, most people have a smartphone right now where you can set either a timer or set alarms in your phone so that you are alerted to take these breaks. Because oftentimes someone will have the best intentions, but it's, it's hard to remember to do that. And so being alerted and you can, you know, you can customize the label of the alert. And so it's at 1030, then we have stand up and do my stretches or, you know, every hour stand up and drink some more water, what have you. And so that people are getting that visual automatically timed reminder. So then they don't even have to have to think about it. It kind of goes on autopilot. I love that. I love the, um, the second thing you mentioned around trying to do some movement before you get tired and then having these alerts. Cause I think it, if you figure out when you start to get tired, so you need to reflect, you need to focus in and think about, you know, start to notice pay attention as to when you start to feel those drops of energy and then to set an alert so you don't have to be consciously thinking about it constantly like oh at 2 30 I generally start to feel tired so maybe at 2 15 I should get up um but having then that second alert to help you so you fit you go through the practice of figuring out when you'll need that boost and then reminding yourself in an automated way is sounds like a really good idea Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's helpful for a lot of people. And it's it's an interesting thing because it is asking them to pay attention. You know, when do I get sleepy? Mm-hmm. And even if they can't recall it right away, well, tomorrow I can observe myself, you know, so then it goes back to that becoming an, an observer of oneself. And so it's sort of allowing them that opportunity to get inquisitive. Exactly. I was thinking that it's basically already getting people to start practicing some more mindfulness and yoga Mm -hmm. um, practices because you have to take that time to reflect. Because as you were mentioning it, I was thinking about when do I get tired? And I know that two o'clock is a time for me and I've noticed that and I tend to try to go to the gym um, before that if possible. I luckily have a pretty flexible schedule. So if I'm able to get out of the house at like 1.30, then I come back and do some more work later, that really, really helps me get through that two o'clock slump. Um, 
but it took me some time to figure out exactly when that time that slump happened um, because I wasn't as aware. So I think it's a really good practice to become more aware and to really think through and notice your own energy levels and your own behavior to be able to make those adjustments. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It's kind of a couple steps in the process, but it's a great one for sure. Yeah. I feel like we are always talking about data and studies and obviously they're really good to uh, understand what are the links between on a broad scale, general patterns and outcomes, but you also are a constant source of data about yourself to yourself Mm -hmm. um, that you don't always pay attention to. And so um, if you think about it that way, you know, yeah, when you're talking about how to solve problems for groups or teams or organizations, thinking about patterns and data is really important. But when you're thinking about how to solve problems for yourself, you're a case study of one, right? So um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you can really pay attention to what the data is telling you about. When do you get tired? When do you feel sluggish? When do you feel most energetic? What makes you feel tired or sluggish? Or, you know, sometimes it can also be good to pay attention to like, oh, maybe it's not a time of day, but maybe it's thinking about or performing a certain task that's really draining for me. So I have to make sure that Mm -hmm. when I'm, you know, about to tackle that task or maybe right after I tackle that task, it's a time that I need to take a break um, to make sure that I'm replenishing my energy or saving my energy up so that I can tackle it fresh um, to make sure that I'm not, uh, you know, going about uh, the task being really, really drained or feeling really drained afterwards. So I think, you know, there's a lot of data out there and encouraging people to pay attention to their own data is pretty important. That's a great point because it's not just times of the day, but then it could also be food, you know, and it's when I eat that certain whatever from down the street, I just feel so sleepy all day long. And so it's really just asking people to learn about themselves and and in your case, you know, study themselves as that case study. And so it's pretty amazing because then it really, it empowers people and, and it's, it's such a powerful way for people to start to, to learn what works for them and what doesn't and, and what's good moving forward and what isn't. And so it's kind of, just an opportunity for people to nurture that important relationship that they have with themselves. Completely agree. I I think it's so important to really understand your, your body and how you're functioning. And I was thinking about food too, as another example, because there are just some things that you can eat during the day that will make you super tired, but maybe your coworker would feel totally fine after it. So just knowing what works for you and learning what works for you is a good journey in and of itself of self-reflection and focus and being able to be a little bit more mindful that can get you in the right direction in the journey of being more physically and mentally healthy. Absolutely. So in terms of your work, um, is there anything that you would like to plug or share? I know you've got a lot of really great um, videos online. You have the yoga at your desk videos, and um, we'd love for you to kind of share a plug for what you do and how you can help our listeners. Sure. Thank you so much. Yes. So the yoga at my desk is an online course and that helps people learn how to integrate the tools of yoga into their workday. And so currently on the course are 10 different videos, about 10 minutes long, that each have a different focus. And so people can do them right at their desk without any extra equipment and without even changing their clothes. So they can do them in their work clothes whenever it works for their schedule. So once they figure out the time that they need to take that yoga break, then they can schedule it in for that time of the day. And so each one has a different focus. And, you know, if you're feeling stressed out, we have a lot of tools for that in yoga, or if you need creativity, or if it's neck and shoulder tension. And so really what it's helping people learn are these tools for self-care. And so there's also different techniques for lowering the stress levels naturally by, you know, the relaxation techniques and the breathing techniques and meditation. And so the online course is at yoga at my desk dot yoga. And so that's a really fun way for people to start to integrate these tools right into their day. I love it. The yo- I love the neck and shoulder tension one that you were just talking about because that yeah, is where I always awesome. carry my tension and I loved that video. <laughs> it's my favorite one. Oh, good. Yeah. Thank you. And then um, I'm not sure how you do it, but if there's show notes or something, what I could do is send you the link yeah. and then people could... I would be more than happy to offer that one as, as a, a freebie for people to try out. So I can definitely send that along to you. 
Great. Yes. We'll include all that in the show notes. Okay, we perfect. will definitely include the link. Um, we'll include the link to both Yoga at My Desk and also Vitality Wellness. Awesome. So please check out the show notes for um, all the ways to contact Megan. Um, is there anything else you wanted to share in terms of your work um, with the audience? I just, I think it's so important for people to take time for themselves every day, whether it's a minute or an hour. It's so important that we are pausing for a few deep breaths every day and whatever form that takes. So some people like to go walking on the beach with their doggy or some people like to do, you know, working out at the gym, whatever it is. It's just really important that we have some time for self-care every day. And it's such an important thing that it, because it's, it affects us on every level and it helps our sleep and our immune function and helps us feel more calm and more present. And so just dedicating a few minutes to yourself every day will definitely go a long a long way. So that's what I would maybe finish with for sure. <laughs> awesome. Speaking of the self, we have one more quick, fun question um, that we hope you believe is fun as well. Um, <laughs> so if you had to pick a yoga pose to symbolize you, what pose would it be? Well... To symbolize me, I was I would think that I would probably pick one of the warrior poses because they're sort of deceptively difficult. You know, when you get into the pose mm-hmm. and you're like, this is fine, I can do this. And then you're in there for three minutes and you're shaking. And it's just been one of those poses that really has taught me a lot. So that I would say that that probably really epitomizes both my journey with yoga and with life that I feel like there's always learning to be done. And there's always an opportunity for us to grow and transform. And I think that that post really teaches us how to be strong and be present and, but also soften our efforts a little bit and just sort of back off when we can and take a rest if we can, you know? And so it really is sort of the epitome of yoga. And and hopefully for me, I guess would be sort of the epitome of the work that I do, just helping people learn how strong they are and learn how many powerful tools they already possess and just taking action with them. I love that. You're definitely a yoga warrior. So (laughs) that feels fitting for sure. Thank you. Kind of curious, Katina, have you thought about one for yourself? What would your yoga pose be? Oh man, I don't know. (laughs) That's a good question. I like the warrior answer. Um, I always liked boat, but I don't know why I'd be a boat. (laughs) 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 That's just what I liked. (laughs) There you go. Like I stay afloat. You, when things are yeah. going uh, going wrong, I try to stay afloat and stay positive. That's why I like both. There, <laughs> there you go. go. That's perfect. That's funny. Uh, how I was about thinking you? for me, I was thinking triangle. I love triangle, but that's really not helpful either in terms of a good metaphor. <laughs> well, life. triangles, like, I don't know. There's some symbolism to a triangle. I don't know what yeah. it is, but... <laughs> well, it's all about balance, right? So triangle is about making the lines of equal distance. And so it's oh, it's really true. about all of the pieces mm-hmm. coming together. And, you know, it really relies on having a strong connection to your base. So being grounded, but also being able to stretch and expand at the same time. Oh, mm. See, you, you answered for me. There I love go. that. <laughs> there we awesome. go. I'm happy with my triangle decision now. Okay, we've got a warrior, we've got a boat, and we've got a triangle. Yes. And I think this <laughs> In a very good episode. <laughs> thank you so much for being here, Megan. We really appreciate it. Yes, oh. thank you. Thank you so much. It's been so fun to chat with you both. And I really appreciate the chance to talk with you and also with your listeners. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you again. And we look forward to see all the cool things that you continue to do with Vitality Wellness. So we'll keep an eye on you for sure. Please. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again. And thank you to all of our listeners. Thank you so much for listening to our wonderful interview with Megan Nolan of Vitality Wellness. If you want to find her, you can look in our show notes. We'll link to her website, which is vitalitywellnessmaui.com and yoga at my desk.yoga. And if you want to reach out to us, we'd love to hear your stories, how you use yoga in the workplace. Um, you can find us at workerbeing.com. You can email us at workerbeing at gmail.com. And you can find us on social media at WorkerBeing on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Thanks so much. The 
Darker Being podcast is hosted by us, Patricia Grabar and Katina Sawyer, and produced by Allie Johnson. Oh,